All right, good day, everyone. Um, we're here to talk to you tonight about how we scaled our uh, little Edutech application up for the increase in remote schooling over what was now, I believe, the first or second COVID lockdown. Um, rather topical, sort of completely inadvertently today. Um, and then we're also going to have a bit of a talk about how, after we kind of accommodated that massive increase in usage, how we scaled our AWS bills down so as not to uh, bankrupt our company. My name is uh, Sean O'Keefe. This is me here. I'm a head of platform at Style. Um, head of platform basically means one, that we're still small enough for all of our uh, managers to give ourselves made up names, but also it means that I'm responsible for infrastructure, CI and developer experience. These are my contact details here. You can hit me up on email or Twitter. Um, only use Twitter to contact me. I'd encourage you not to look at any of the content there. It is not something you want to be involved in. Also with me tonight is uh, Matt Borden. This is Matt. Matt is our senior SRE um, and also my DevOps life partner. Me and Matt have been working together for a while now and we're responsible for all things reliability and style. This is um, Matt's contact details here. Hit him up on email and likewise his Twitter feed. Uh, far more meaningful content there for people who are into tech as well. So as I said before, we work for a company called Style Education. This is us. Um, we're about 50 people. We are a blended learning tool, which means that we aren't necessarily a remote learning tool per se. Um, the model that we kind of propose and really actually in addition to providing a technology platform for um, also provide training to teachers is something that we call blended learning, which basically means that we like to have teachers use style in the classroom to supplement or basically like add to their lessons to provide like what we think is an actual better model of education. Um, we're doing okay. We're odds are better than not that we're probably in a school nearby you and you probably know somebody who's using us in school. Now, as an edutech company, we face one particular problem. Uh, it's that basically most of our users currently in Australia, all of our customers, so they're clustered closely in one time zone. All of our customers have school holidays. Um, so that means basically every 10 weeks or so, we have close to no users and just get to pretend that we're a startup again. So like, it's cool because having no users mean that we can get lots of work done um, without having to worry too much about what happens to the site. The downside is that we have no real visibility into whether we make a change that really breaks performance um, for the site. And um, I'm just gonna quickly move my notes, guys. Sorry, just two seconds. Much better. Um, and we've had a bit of trouble in the past with this actually getting us into trouble at the start of term. When everyone comes back, we find that some of the changes we've shipped over the school holidays actually have brought our performance down a bit and we get a bit sluggish. Um, and lastly, due to how our sales cycle works, we basically get all of our new users at the start of the school year, which is like, you know, around about uh, February or January, February each year. So let's kind of uh, set the scene. It's term one, 2020. Um, the thing that I've just described has happened. Uh, schools come back. And like this is back in the days when 2020 wasn't a number that made your blood run cold. It was just another year for us kicking off our year and seeing kind of what happened when all of our new users came online. Um, we weren't completely sure what our user count was going to be. We have a rough idea from what our sales folks tell us we've kind of got in the pipeline. Um, we basically just made sure we addressed all the points that could accommodate a small increase in load. And then we also carefully managed what new work we added in over the holidays to make sure it wasn't like a large amount of stuff that was potentially going to be performance impact. And mainly to get through that little increase and uptick that we have at the start of each year, we were counting on auto scaling. Um, and this is basically how we deal with, auto, with our increase in load each year, basically adding new servers automatically based on metrics. So this is our system. Um, it's called autopilot. Now we're only deliver work of the highest standard here at Style and our diagrams are no exception. I've put these together while I was drawing with my four-year-old. Uh, this is the main way I get work done on this stuff while I'm at home is that we both get the textures out and I write up my slides. Um, the way this works is basically we have our backend stack there or our uh, async stack and each of them um, runs a container we call Autopilot. We've written it in-house. Um, they run an election for each cluster and actually decide which one's going to be running things. And then that container continuously polls Prometheus metrics and has a look at saying like, how's the CPU looking on all the boxes in this auto scaling group? And what are the queue lengths like for the async group? And basically add servers dynamically um, based on what load we're seeing. This is what it looks like in action. These are some of our Prometheus graphs on auto scaling actually happening. 
you can see there that each autopilot instance runs off a bunch of different metrics, including things like CPU, queue lengths, pool usage. And also sometimes it just runs on a schedule, some part it runs on a schedule. So for example, when things really kick off at the start of the day, when everyone comes on along at about 9 a.m., we scale right up to about you know peak server count at about 8.30 a.m. to make sure we're ready to accommodate for that change. And that's something that we'll talk around a bit later. But basically this system covers two things really well. It covers fine scaling, so scaling up and down during the day as our load increases and decreases. We see little peaks throughout the day as sort of classes finish. Um, but it also handles that core scaling that we talked about where we have a whole bunch of new users come online at the start of the year and within reason, it'll just dump extra servers on top of it to make things which just work. So how did we go turn one? We went great. We got to the end of turn one, no serious outages or problems. The system largely worked and everything looked like it was going to be fine. So just for the important context, end of term one uh, 2020 was March. Uh, March 2020 now is probably a very relevant date for uh, a lot of Melbournians and white Australians in general. It was towards the end of the term, we started hearing a lot of chatter about COVIDs. We weren't really paying heaps of attention. We were too busy celebrating our success. And then Democracy Dan came on telly in his fleece. And that's when we kind of knew that uh, 2020 was beginning in earnest. So for anyone who hasn't been watching the news, that was obviously when we had our big COVID outbreak, yeah. our ensuing um, lengthy period of lockdown and a sizable transition in all schools in Australia to remote learning. Now, we kind of had mixed feelings um, in Australia. This was kind of a bit of a difficult thing. Um, like on one hand, as a workforce and regular citizens, um, we face like a lot of challenges that everyone else is going to be facing. Most of us transitioned to full remote. We didn't get to see our workmates as much. And a lot of our staff were genuinely just very, very concerned with a lot of stuff that was happening to family and friends, both in Australia and overseas. On the other hand, lockdown and the transition to remote education was a big opportunity for us to do like tons of good for kids who were doing it tough throughout the lockdown. It was a chance for a lot of schools that had had subscriptions to Style but weren't getting a lot out of it to kind of get reacquainted with us. And it was a chance for a lot of schools that hadn't discovered Style before to learn about us. On the other hand, it was just going to be a ton of new users. And to make matters worse, our CEO did this. Um, for those of you who don't have crash on eyesight, this is basically our CEO telling the entire nation of Australia that they may use our product for free. And with that offer basically came the implicit guarantee that style wouldn't catch fire and fall down while they were using it. So me and Matt on the SRA team were kind of in a bit of a situation. We've got auto scaling, right? Like we can handle an increase in usage. What's the problem? The big problem is that we weren't going to see just a small incremental increase in usage. We were potentially going to see something like up to about eight times our existing usage of about 10K concurrent users, we'll be predicting somewhere around 80K concurrent users. And the thing that will get you there is bottlenecks. So the assumption that underpins our auto scaling strategy is basically that for small changes in customer usage, we can assume that there will only be a linear increase, proportionate linear increase in resource usage. Um, and if our platform only hand, like, handled requests and then sent back static responses, and that's all it did, we could auto scale merrily forever, but in reality, to do anything meaningful with an application, you need to have data stores, you need to have um, clusters of like, you know, message queues, all sorts of things on the back end, which they use. And you fundamentally hit this thing where if as you add more and more back end servers, they will handle the request fine, but they're going to load these other things. And eventually one of these other things is going to break. Those things are your bottlenecks. So let's talk through our architecture and I kind of highlight a few of where a few of those bottlenecks are. You can see in the middle are our sort of core parts of our app, the backend boxes, which handle requests, the async boxes, which handle like deferrable work, and our SSE boxes, which are unsurprisingly responsible for SSE. These reach out to, as you can see, quite a tangled web of backend dependencies. Um, and basically any one of these things can get knocked over and bring our entire stack down. We can take steps to mitigate the impact of that or make it far less likely. But the fundamental fact of reality here is that we can't just keep adding and adding and adding backend servers without having to like without accommodating for that additional load on one of these um, uh, downstream dependencies. So what's going to get us on these downstreams? It could just be something as simple as CPU load, basic load on the machine. 
or it could be exhaustion where instead there's a pool of resources that the increased number of users or the increased number of boxes, even talking to these downstream um, services, just completely use it up and we fall over catastrophically. So this, that sort of dynamic we're talking about is once again, expertly summed up in this picture. Um, the case here where we have a whole bunch of different servers connecting to one central downstream service and they're all sharing a resource is fine. Adding backend boxes, you can add as many as you want there and they won't knock over this server. The problem you get when you talk about exhaustion is here when each new box that gets added or like to, you know, you'll add one box to accommodate 5,000 new concurrent users, say, but each of those 5,000 user increments will add one box, which will take out one new set of resources on this new machine, which eventually will make that machine fall over. There's just tons that can go wrong, basically, in all these backend things as we add more users. So like if we talk through some examples, you're going to imagine things like, for example, if we're increasing the number of servers in our async worker pool, they all handle um, sending messages, they basically service messages off RabbitMQ. Adding too many servers in the async pool will add too many queues to RabbitMQ, which may exhaust its memory. Um, we want to check that our console servers are the right instance type. Um, console servers are interesting in that we can't actually scale them up. We're largely stuck with about five instances. Um, because adding more than that means that the uh, clustering protocol that it uses, uh, Raft, actually makes the servers so busy that they can't do meaningful work outside of it. Um, and then we have the, the, the obvious fundamentals, Mongo, MySQL, what can their connection pools hold? How much memory do we need to actually be able to open up all those connections to the new servers? These are the considerations that are on our mind. So what do we do? Like, we can we can outline these characteristics. We know where the problem is going to be. We know what our downstreams are. Obviously, we should just go and fix them all, right? We did a bit of maths about like at the time when we knew that we were switching to remote learning, and we came to the conclusion it was going to take us about three years to make all the changes that we thought would mitigate all the potential failures in our downstream services. Now, this was at the end of the term. We had until term two when it was going to be formally that remote education started. So we had about three weeks to do a best effort job of making sure that we didn't blow up. The worst thing about this was that we didn't really have any way to kind of say the changes that we made didn't break anything because we're in school holidays. No one was using our service. So even if we made performance improvements or what we thought were performance improvements, we wouldn't know what the system looks like under load until we actually come back live and when it's too late. What are we going to do? How do we make sure style doesn't go down? And when we only have three weeks? We double the size of everything, basically. I want to say that we did something a lot more sophisticated, but this was it. We're not joking. This probably doesn't belong in a talk about, SR, about SRE work, but fundamentally, this is just one of the best things we could do to make sure we didn't get caught flat-footed by something silly. Our Prometheus servers, our console cluster, our MySQL instance, uh, our Mongo cluster. We basically made the decision that doubling the size of these things, the cost of money is small. The cost of engineering time, especially when we only have three weeks of it, is very high. And the cost of an outage in this time when we're really selling ourselves as like we can help everybody in Australia is highest of all. So we basically just did the maths of what it would be like to double everything, brought it to our C classes. They weighed that up against the business value and it was pretty much a no brainer. So I would say don't go straight to the Google SRE book each time you've got to like solve a scaling problem. Sometimes money can just make the problem go away. From there, our next step was we guessed. We basically wanted to like figure out what running under like st uh, load at steady state was going to be like. That was, we talked about resource source exhaustion. This is this problem. We're kind of saying that if we scale up to, let's say 80,000 users, how many servers is that, going to, is that going to require? And what would this system look like if we did that? We knew the number 80K from our sales team. Basically, they had a rough idea of one, how many existing users we have, how many users were kind of signed up to the platform but not using us actively and how many schools had signed up to come on as free customers. From there, we could kind of do a sort of linear interpolation, not interpolation, but linear inference thing to say, okay, this is the number of users we expect to have on. This is the number of servers we're going to have on. And then we did something really simple. We just basically scaled up all of our servers to that number. We um, told Autopilot to make sure that like we actually are running that many servers. And we saw what things run out of resources, just servicing the um, servers without any actual usage. So the real cool thing about autopilot was that we can just actually give it a little schedule and say, hey, each day, 
even if the CPU load is only telling you we need 20 boxes, scale up to 150 just to see. And this was actually super effective. It showed that we were actually sitting sort of on the precipice of a number of failures that we were only going to see the first time we scaled up to those box counts. We solved a ton of the potential issues we were going to see just in the first week by doing this. So number two, have a look. We had a look at what steady state resource exhaustion was looking like. What do we do next? We used like, you know, a, probably our best possible scientific approach, like, you know, some sort of like theory, hypothesis, like really like broke down the system. No, just kidding. We did what we call feelings-based bottleneck identification. That's basically where we eyeballed all of our graphs that we knew, like, so with the you know, Prometheus graphs that were telling us about how servers were performing, where the stress points are. We looked at our understanding of architecture to kind of say, here's where the problems are probably going to be. And most importantly, we reviewed our like last 12 months of outages to try and identify what parts of our system were clearly under stress. And un by all counts, basically Rabbit and Rabbit and Q, which is our message queue, was the thing that bubbled to the top of the stack. It, its name kind of appeared, even if it wasn't a primary player, it was always a side actor in all of our outages. It was clearly very loaded and often uh, simply adding more resources to it wasn't solving the problem. So we kind of really dug into how we could like put it under load under some sort of synthetic load without actually having any users or to see where the failures were going to happen with it. And we came up with, it's a pretty tried and true process, but we we're pretty happy with the way we implemented it for Rabbit. We did something called traffic duplication. Um, and the basic idea was we just took messages that were passed to the client um, and Rabbit and duplicated them in our code. So basically duplicated them in our Ruby client for um, Rabbit, sent them over the bus on Rabbit, um, and then uh, deleted just the duplicates on the other side uh, in our consumers that were also in our code base. So basically each message that got duplicated had a little header added to it saying basically, I am a duplicate. They would travel over the bus, um, the, the RabbitMQ bus and uh, add load to the system, but then they would be dropped unceremoniously on the other side. So this is what duplication looks like. We're adding those extra ones on there and you can see at the far end, we basically just lose that last one. The cool thing about this is it doesn't uh, create weird problems with accidentally duplicating data. We didn't have to be conf confident that all of our operations were like, you know, repeatable, that they were identical and um, w w weren't going to like override each other. We could basically just say, put this onto Rabbit and Rabbit alone and then drop it on the other side. And again, we had tremendous success with this. This showed again that Rabbit really was on the brink of falling over. Um, I think in the end, we found that the problem was that we were loading some of our queues up too much. So we ended up sharding our Rabbit cluster and this solved things really nicely for us. We ended up having no problems with Rabbit when the, uh, when the back to school surge came around. So this is where we are at the moment. This is kind of has been our plan and that all constituted about two, two and a half weeks work. And it's all super simple stuff. And the stuff I kind of want to drive home by this talk is that you do not need the super galaxy brain sort of like, you know, we're going to have circuit breakers and bulwarks and all sorts of stuff around the place to make things work. Often this stuff will surface if you really just got to make sure that you're covered for the next week or so. And we actually really unlock some really clever insights with some very basic moves. But we had to assume that we weren't going to succeed um, here um, and find a way to um, account for the fact that one day if we like at one point if we do fail how can we make it so that this doesn't come down to the rest of the actual like the entire site and give us time a bit of breathing space to actually fix things before like style goes down we didn't escape hatch what we came up was again it's not something we invented but load shedding we wanted a way to basically say if we saw that style was getting loaded that wasn't able to handle this many users what can we not service um in order to make sure that at least style for the majority of people was up and somewhat usable so the thing that we were able to really leverage here was our api labeling um all of our apis if you guys have really good eyesight you can see um, are labeled with an slo level so basically for our, our slo is broken into three levels level one is basically all the core things you need to teach a class it's our most important level it basically says that we, above all else, want to prioritise um, the experience of teachers and students who are in a class. The one thing we really don't want are teachers sitting in front of a class, watching a spinner on style or you know, calling IT while the class is slowly like getting distracted and moving on. 
L2 is more about the stuff like uh, homework or stuff that people do offline or marking that can be done like outside of class is urgent and important, but possibly deferrable work. And then from there, L3 is just all the stuff that makes style nice, but it's potentially negotiable. So we just basically implemented uh, flags in console that we could turn on and off that would turn on um, dropping a percentage of L3 and a percentage of L2 um, load shedding. We also looked around and said, okay, what are the routes that are like expensive and kind of add sugar to style, but don't make it like contribute to the core usability experience. And we put throttles on all of these as well that we could dial up again, using console to have it live loaded into the actual um, servers and drop some percentage of requests from those um, endpoints or actually make them not make the request to start with. Um, and one of the things that like we did here was our auto save where if you, students are typing away on an answer. Um, one of the things that like we can do there is not save it or not sync it back to our server so quickly. And the worst thing that happens there is they might navigate away, get a little prompt saying, please hold on a second and then navigate on. It was a way to remove a lot of server load from our servers without any real cost. So this was the fourth point for us. It was having a plan to fail. Here is sort of like our roadmap for how we got through the whole thing. And that basically constituted the three week. So how did we go? Monday was great. Monday was the day that everyone came back or at least half the country did. Um, school comes back basically across two days, oh, sorry, two weeks across it. Um, but with a bit of a little work up from Monday, often Monday's a bit quieter. Um, with teachers uh, getting back from holiday, doing their work and then students coming back on Tuesday. We got onto Tuesday and things very quickly started to go pear-shaped. So fairly early on, we started to get pages that some of our services were falling over. We were seeing very clear issues with our RDS instance. And this is when we knew things were really bad. We got a page from New Relic. We hadn't actually used Relic for New Relic for two years. So there's some sort of weird sort of archeological artifact of some as, um, page we had that like had just not fired because we had never crashed this hard in a very long time actually reached us in Slack. So that was a big deal. And look, the point of this talk isn't really to talk out that failure. Um, what was behind it was that we uh, hit we, we run a very, very large number of connections to uh, RDS. We uh, a microservice that has actually been rolled back into a monolith. And each of the individual services that have been rolled back into a monolith are still using their own connection pools, which means we have a lot of connections on RDS. We pay a bit of extra money to make that possible, but we hit a very strange bug in temp file usage where with the increased usage from like the increased number of users um, and the increased number of boxes, um, RDS wasn't releasing uh, temp file handles, which basically exhausted our disks and corrupted our entire RDS instance. So we don't need to get into that, but I'll send you guys, I'll put up a link later on about, um, sorry for our CEO's write-up of what went wrong. So what went well? I think uh, the big things for me were that load sh shedding really got us back in the game. We basically bounced back from the complete corruption of our RDS instance in 24 hours, which was a bummer, but we were back. We were seeing performance issues for some time afterwards. Load shedding was what kept our site up while we debug these problems. Our message queue stayed up after the sharding of our uh, rabbit instances. And basically, I think we just learned a lot. We got a really, really valuable system in this load shedding system that we put together. Oh, so I did the same thing twice, basically. Um, other things we learned, I guess, were that traffic duplication is really, really great. We want to kind of expand it to a lot more of our other services as well. Rabbit was easy because we kind of controlled the in and the out. It's harder to do with like a database because you don't want to overwrite stuff or accidentally overwrite think something with stale data. But it's, I think, a really powerful paradigm and it gives you way better, I think, sort of like data with like, sorry, um, events with way more fidelity to reality than like synthetically generated like click um, simulation. So we're really pumped about that. And it's always good just to remember, if you can do it, spending money makes problems go away. So that's the CEO's instance report there. It's a great read. Um, Byron, our CEO, is a really, really articulate dude, and he did a far better job than we did in the actual post-mortem. I'm going to hand over to Matt now. Um, thank you very much. So as Sean mentioned, uh, I'm Matt Borden. Uh, 
me and Sean have been working together for about three years now, and uh, he really is my DevOps life partner. Um, so that's me. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the other side of the story, which was what we did uh, once all our users had gone back to school, um, but our bill was very high. So over the course of the year, we'd experienced this large uptick from uh, COVID, but our bill had also seen this large uptick from spending all this money to make everything work. So we're in February, we we're spending about 40K, but by May, we we're spending 120K. Um, and this was the result of all the scaling up we did of our supporting infrastructure, so our databases, our logs, uh, our metrics, um, but and also adding additional EC2 instances within our uh, stack. But we have this problem. Our May bill was the largest the company had ever received from AWS, and if we continued to spend that much going forwards, the business would have faced some serious financial risks. We also uh, faced a large sudden decrease in the number of active users, with many states returning to in-person learning. Um, so it was becoming really hard to justify running all this additional infrastructure. So by May, our AWS bill had really just been replaced with this big money fire. We needed to unwind all the wonderful work we did uh, scaling up but we wanted to do it in a way that was going to be safe and reliable. So Sean mentioned that we had some problems with our uh, database. We'd scaled up to the largest database uh, we could uh, get in the class uh, that we're using. Um, so we were on like a 24x large. Um, and we actually kept our database running at that size, um, costing us uh, 34K a month, whereas in February it had cost us 10K a month. And we ran that for a, quite a uh, while, for a few, another few months after we had that outage. Um, and the reason we did that was we thought we could buy ourselves some error budget, some room to get our heads around the problems and continue to spend that money to really understand everything that was going on in our stack and um, be able to dig into the causes of that outage without the pressure of needing to uh, resolve it immediately. So the other big things we were worried about within our bill was um, we'd switched from spot instances to on-demand when uh, COVID started. We thought there were going to be a number of uh, other businesses that were going to be trying to get getting capacity for uh, their own services moving to online. Um, and so what we did was we switched half our capacity back to spot capacity. And we ran that uh, for a few days and ticked it back up uh, to till we got to about 90%. We saw a pretty big reduction from that. Um, but we also had scaled up uh, the sizes of our EC2 instances. Um, and so we had to scale all of those back down. Now, the way we did that was we used auto scaling to increase the number of instances uh, and decrease the size of some of those instances. And then we were able to tick back down uh, the number of instances. And we weren't just uh, kind of pulling the rug out from under ourselves here. We had load shedding in our back pocket in case any of the changes we were making didn't work. So the big thing that really made scaling up easy also made scaling down easy. So we use uh, CPU-based auto-scaling, um, but we also have time of day auto-scaling. So you can see in this graph, we scale up at uh, 8 a.m. We scale up to um, a kind of peak number of servers that we think is going to be a really good starting point for the day. We configure that, and we're able to uh, we're able to set it to kind of 70 or 80 instances on days that we thought we were going to have a lot of traffic um, based off kind of the previous week's usage. Um, but what this also lets us do is scale up before all our traffic comes on. Um, unlike a lot of other websites, we don't get a lot of um, kind of uh, users coming on gradually. We get uh, all our users basically signing on at the start of the school day at 9 a.m. But we didn't want to run all those servers if we weren't using them. So what we did was uh, we kick in uh, CPU-based auto-scaling at 11 a.m. By that time, we've had a couple of hours to see how the load would go with uh, quite an additional number of servers, and then we're able to start scaling back down. So you can see that here. Uh, once uh, CPU-based auto-scaling kicks in, you can see that the graph becomes a, a lot more variable. 
And so this worked really well. We were able to do it each day uh, and able to tick down the number of instances we started up at the um, start of the day, gradually down and down and down. Um, and this meant that we were never going to be surprised by uh, our traffic patterns again. But what we were starting to see was there was a lot of variability in our costs. Uh, you can see here that uh, through May, we had uh, kind of double, nearly double the amount of users. Um, but as we started down, we'd get these big spikes on Monday morning where we had to adjust our uh, capacity. So we were using the uh, AWS Cost Explorer to try and map uh, the number of users we were seeing to the bills we were getting and try and figure out uh, which parts of our stack were scaling with users and which parts weren't. Um, but these CSVs that we were downloading from Cost Explorer and all the time we were spending in Excel really made it hard to uh, like reproduce those results. So we needed something that was going to be uh, reproducible, but also that we could share around. Emailing C Excel documents around um, just wasn't cutting it anymore. And so we did some research and we found that AWS will actually dump your entire bill um, into S3 for you. And then we would found these uh, documents in S3, set it up, got our bill dumped into there. But we needed a way to query it. So we could actually uh, use Amazon Athena to run SQL over our bill. And this meant we could start to uh, query multiple variables. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is an SQL query that we could run over our entire AWS bill, um, looking at uh, what instance reservations we had versus what uh, um, capacity we were using and figure out uh, what reservations we needed to buy or what savings plans. So that SQL query pumps out this wonderful table uh, that gave us exactly the amount of usage uh, we were, had reserved. Um, and it also let us figure out how much of our savings plan uh, we, how much of our EC2 spend we were able to cover with savings plans. So savings plans are an upfront commitment to uh, uh, EC2 spend, um, but you're locked in for a, a year or three years. Um, so we wanted to identify what we were using, and you can see the big uptick was when we uh, had the big scale up. Uh, and then as we'd come down, uh, we gradually ticked up our uh, savings plan spend um, as we were grew more comfortable with a new COVID normal and uh, grew more comfortable with the idea of locking ourselves into that spend. So the other thing we were able to do was build this neat little dashboard. Um, so this is our Cost Explorer dashboard, uh, kind of our version of it rather than uh, AWS's. Um, and it has a number of uh, really useful tools here. So up in the corner, we've got the total month spend. That's what our uh, C class really cares about. They want to see how much money is the AWS bill costing this month. Um, below that, we've got the usage uh, type over the last two days. So those are the individual line items, which are uh, what's costing us the most money uh, today, yesterday. And being able to look at that and go, ah, oh, we're spending uh, all our money on uh, C4, 5X five, five large instances. Um, let's go look at what uh, those instances are doing and are we using them to our full capacity? Um, and so that was super useful for devs to be able to dig into. We've got the savings plan graph underneath that, which was super useful for um, uh, buying reservations. And then um, we've got uh, that blue graph in the corner over there is uh, a daily spend, and then we're able to set a budget. And when our uh, daily spend ticks over that budget, we get a notification. So we were able to use this dashboard to really start to dig into what were we spending money on. And the big thing we uh, identified up front was untagged resources. Um, we couldn't account for where about uh, a quarter of our bill was going to. Uh, these were untagged uh, instances that had come from uh, scaling things up manually or just uh, instances that have been around for ages and hadn't been uh, deployed under something like Terraform. But in AWS, it's really hard to figure out um, what's not tagged by a cost explorer. Whereas having access to that more granular data in S3, let us dig into which instance IDs were untagged um, 
and what were they costing? So once we tagged everything, um, we were able to uh, use some of the AWS tools to enforce policies that meant uh, you couldn't create new untagged instances. So nothing can come into our account. No uh, EC2 instances can be created without tags on them now. Um, and this means that we just don't have to manage that uh, infrastructure lying around. So once we'd done that, we got a much more accurate uh, dashboard and we were able to start digging into uh, how we could start saving some money. And the big thing that came up for us was NAT gateway usage. If you've uh, been in a AWS land before, you might have come across NAT gateways. Um, so NAT gateways are a way of uh, bringing uh, outbound traffic into your inbound, sorry, bringing, sending outbound requests and getting those response and sending them back to instances that um, have only private IPs and don't have a public IP. Um, you'll probably have interacted with this either by setting up a NAT yourself or using uh, it in AWS. But we use, we're using a managed NAT gateway. Um, and we came across this wonderful tweet from Corey, uh, Corey Quinn saying that there was a, this NAT gateway data processing fee. Um, and we came around uh, to the idea that this was actually costing us a lot of money. So not only were we per, uh, paying for the data transfer cost, but we were, were paying um, basically double the data transfer cost in this NAT gateway processing fee. So we dug into our uh, NAT gateway architecture and found that a lot of these, uh, the external traffic we were sending through that was um, requests to third-party services. We do a lot of video transcoding, um, a lot of image transcoding. Um, and so we looked for ways within our application to uh, reduce uh, the amount of uh, that happening and the data being sent through that NAT gateway. Um, and the other thing we did was in our uh, dev and CI accounts where we uh, don't really need such high availability, uh, we were able to dig uh, to set up NAT instances. So NAT instances are a much more low availability way to run a NAT, um, which works well for uh, our development accounts where we don't run high availability infrastructure um, and our CI accounts where um, we're able to retry builds if things fail. So we were able to set up a set of NAT instances um, and just ditch that entire NAT gateway processing cost. Um, this was a massive uh, like uh, achievement for our bill. Uh, we dropped about five grand off our bill from doing this, um, which was pretty significant at the time. Um, so these were some of the other cost savings, uh, switching to uh, AWS Graviton instances, uh, saved us about 30%. Um, reducing inter-AZ traffic, uh, so having all our traffic be served, uh, served by the same um, servers that our load balancers were in, um, making sure that the availability zone mapping was working there, um, saved us a heap. Um, using VPC endpoints, so we weren't sending traffic over the internet. Um, and identifying uh, S3 buckets that um, were lying around and moving some of that data out over to Glacier uh, if we didn't need it. Um, so that was how we scaled down our bill um, and scaled up our site. So I'm going to hand over to Sean now, who's going to uh, chat quickly through uh, hiring. Thanks, Matt. So just a very quick pitch at the end. Um, Matt's got our details to contact us on there. Um, you can also just jump onto uh, styleeducation.com. We have a careers page there with the uh, contact details. But basically, uh, we are hiring at the moment. Uh, we've got three positions that we are actively looking for. Um, so uh, first of all, we'd really like to hire a uh, senior front-end engineer, someone with a fair bit of experience who's especially interested in possible, possibly a transition to management. Um, me and Matt are hiring on our team. Uh, we want to possibly get a really strong mid to senior on uh, infrastructure work, especially someone who's into Terraform, AWS, really likes cutting tooling, that sort of business. Again, just give us a shout if you want to learn more about that. And we also want to get someone on our CI and developer experience discipline. Again, probably someone who's going to be leading up this discipline for us, someone who knows a lot about uh, CI, CD, 
experience with something like Build Kite will be really, really cool, but also someone who just really enjoys putting together tooling for other developers. They'll be responsible for one, running our CI, CD pipelines, um, but also putting together all of our dev tools and kind of maintaining and improving them. So if anybody's looking for work, if it sounds like anything we're doing there looks interesting, um, give us a shout and we can talk, even if uh, what we've described there isn't a job you're looking for. Get in touch and we'll see what we can do. Anyway, thanks very much. Thanks heaps, guys. That was great. A re re really, really interesting talk. Um, I, I, I had a couple of questions um, for you. Um, the, the first one was uh, in regards to the Graviton instances. I'm, look, I'm not a AWS user myself, but was was keen to understand. Uh, it's not something that I've come across before. What, what exactly are they? Sorry. 100%. So it's a recent development. They've uh, brought this new uh, processor type, which basically performs probably better than a lot of their conventional processors, but also is a lot cheaper. Um, it's available for both EC2 instances and RDS instances. We've made the move with RDS. Yeah. Um, basically just tried it out for a long time on our read replicas to make sure that they weren't going to have any obvious performance problems. And once we're happy with it, switch it over to our, um, our main uh, production master as well. So we've got all of our databases running off Graviton now. But they're yeah. also available on EC2, but that does kind of require a bit more sort of testing and tuning to make sure that we have the right kind of workloads yeah. to take advantage of them. But I'd definitely encourage anyone who's looking to knock a fair old swath off their bill, um, look into them. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, the other question I had is you mentioned um, yeah, about the alert from New Relic. Um, what, what, um, uh, what, 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 what other tool are you using that, that is capturing a lot of that okay. stuff? And, and, and New Relic. Um, just yeah. a bit of the hip pocket a bit too hard and we didn't have all the features we want. So we basically yeah. just switched to the practice of really taking, like picking and choosing all these different self-hosted options that we um, okay. like. So for metrics, we're using Prometheus. Um, yeah. Really super happy with that. Would recommend anyone get into it. Elk stack for logging, somewhat less happy with that. We're having just a lot of trouble really operating it. I think you need someone who's just really pumped about interacting with Elasticsearch if you want to keep one of those guys going. So we're kind of investigating um, host adoptions again, specifically around logs. Um, and we also use Jaeger for our tracing. Jaeger's super cool, super powerful. Um, probably a bit of a challenge to actually query anything once it's in there. Again, we're probably looking at a few other hosted providers like Honeycomb which would potentially solve our whole tracing and logging uh, situation in one. Obviously there's, you know, I, I know that in terms of the work that you do is, 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 is hybrid in terms of remote and in, in class, but um, with students most likely to, to be returning to home, you know, is there anything that you've had to prepare for or has, has the work from the kind of last 12 months set you up? Um, I think we're pretty much well established and ready to kind of handle like these short, sharp lockdowns. The yeah. big issue with this first one was really that um, all schools were staring down potentially an entire term remote. So there was a very sort of hard switch in a very wide spectrum of schools that we didn't like, weren't sort of conventional real like big embraces of technology were coming onto our platform. That was just this massive like until, unpre until then unprecedented increase in usage. Where yeah, yeah. now what we more see is just like schools that are really like strong style users will use it a bit more. When we have yeah. these lockdowns, other schools will just like use more conventional methods and we've got a few schools that have come over. Yeah. Use more. But the big thing we've seen in increase since COVID really was that after things went back to that sort of new COVID normal, a lot of schools did stay on with us. And the main thing we've really had to work on is just keeping our sort of cells uh, what we can handle about three to four times what we were seeing before, but in a prolonged fashion. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, there's no, there's no other questions that have come through on the the, the channel, and um, Tom's still trying to battle for the mute button. So, Can you hear me now. Oh, there we go. For <laughs> sake, <laughs> um, Yeah, Sean, Dill just took my question. So, oh no. In terms of like, if everyone was to go back tomorrow, would you be able to keep your AWS spend down, or do you think it would obviously it would hike somewhat, but? Yeah, look, we're pretty comfortable that we can. We've really hit some of these big things that were just lingering around that we had no visibility of. And I guess like it's more about like we build a capability so that even if we do get three times as many users on tomorrow and we manage to stay up, um, we've got the tools now that we can really easily dig into what that's costing. And like at the end of the day, if we have three times as much traffic, we know that we're going to have to spend more on AWS. It's the main concern for us is, is it proportionate? Like are our bills going up in a way we would expect to with that increase in usage, or are we actually really bleeding money somewhere in AWS in a way that isn't really directly supporting that extra usage? 
So we have the tools to answer that question now. We can see what our daily users are, ad accounts are. We can see like at a high level of granularity where our AWS spend is going to. And then we can say, hey, this number, the database usage, the network usage has gone up too much for what we've seen. This is wrong. Let's drill into it. So it's about like we can take better corrective action now. Yeah. Oh, cool.